Welcome to Martin M. Caldwell Investigates. I'm Martin Caldwell, and this is part two of the Bruce Ivins anthrax story. Part one, we establish that the FBI and the mass media are perfectly ready to close the books on Bruce Ivins and let him go down in history as the perpetrator of the anthrax attacks. To the Ivins family, I would like to extend my most heartfelt condolences at the loss of a devoted husband and father. I assure you that I'll not stop until his guilt or innocence is decided against the backdrop of numerous more likely suspects. In this segment, we'll begin to connect the dots between the following people. Senator Charles Grassley, Republican of Iowa. Admiral William Crow Jr., owner of Intervac, LLC. And Fad El Hebri, the CEO of Emergent Biosolutions, formerly Bioport. Though Bruce Ivins did his research at Fort Detrick, Maryland, he worked for VaxGen of Brisbane, California. This company had a contract to produce an anthrax vaccine for the Department of Defense, and Bruce Ivins personally held the hard-earned patents to VaxGen's version of the vaccine. The company was on track to earn $877 million as it met the terms of the contract with the DOD and delivered the required doses. However, the FDA began to put serious roadblocks in front of the company by holding up approval of human trials. Where comes Senator Charles Grassley, who in 2005 and 6 chaired the Senate Finance Committee. In an April 2005 letter to Health and Human Services Secretary Michael Levitt, Grassley fires off about the fact that not one dose of an anthrax vaccine has been delivered by VaxGen. This letter was strategically released to the media with no mention of the fact that it was the FDA that had been holding up the contract. Furthermore, he was beating the Bush administration's drum of Project BioShield, which had yet to achieve any of the goals that President Bush had set forth. Behind the scenes, Grassley had been the target of major lobbying efforts by Emergent Biosolutions. The lobbyists included John M. Clarici, a lawyer who, interestingly enough, had helped shape the BioShield legislation in the first place. This fact directly links BioSolutions' concerns to George Bush's White House. These lobbyists also took political pot shots at Mr. Simonson, the health department official in charge of BioShield, calling him the Mike Brown of Health and Human Services. You may remember Mike Brown was in charge of FEMA during Hurricane Katrina. Now this did exactly what BioSolutions wanted, which was to turn up the heat on the subject and pressure critical officials to look toward their company as a way to save political face and to finally get George Bush's Project BioShield underway. What ensued was a lobbying war between VaxGen and Emergent BioSolutions. In 2003, Emergent had spent 210000 followed uh, by 380000 in 2004, and a whopping $1.2 million in 2005. This compares to just 200,000 the VaxGen was able to muster altogether. In Eric Lipton's New York Times article dated September 18, 2006, he writes, In a series of meetings with lawmakers and administration officials, Emergent Biosolutions attacked their rival. VaxGen has a history of failure and irregularities, their briefing book said. VaxGen has never produced an FDA-approved product, and its vaccine is based on unproven technology, leaving the health and protection of the American people on a company with a history of scientific failure and financial scandal. It's no accident that VaxGen officials hadn't been invited to those meetings. The following are two quick snapshots from the New York Stock Exchange of what happened to both companies financially around this time. The results aren't surprising. The irony is that after initially criticizing Bruce Ivan's vaccine, Emergent, with the help of its CEO, Fahd El Hebri, obtained Ivan's patents. Essentially, VaxGen, having been completely ruined, had little choice but to try and recoup development costs by licensing the Ivan's formula. In future segments, I'll examine these patent dealings in closer detail. What should be noted here is that by this time, the FBI had already begun to target Bruce Ivins in their anthrax DAC investigation. This, I imagine, might be why he was unable to mount a legal battle to prevent Emergent from basically stealing his work. Worse is the fact that shortly after the attacks, Ivans was approached by the FBI for help with identifying the strain of anthrax used in the letters. This was supposed to be due to his expertise. Many more details on that to come in future segments as well. Part 3 of Bruce Ivans, The Anthrax Story, will examine Admiral William Crow and others who had governmental dealings with Bioport. Please email any comments or concerns to martinmcaldwell at yahoo.com. Thank you.